In this episode of Types of Transition, acoustic recording artist and composer Michael Gettle shares his journey and notable career transitions. Michael went all in on music at age eight. With strong support from his non-musical parents, he poured himself into learning trumpet and piano. By middle school, he was already composing his own music. By senior year in high school, he was attending double sessions to get all the music courses he possibly could. Well accomplished in high school, he went on to get a double degree in music composition and theory. After college, Michael added a teaching credential to meet practical realities. Not long after that, our paths crossed when Michael sat in on piano for our church worship team. It was clear after a few minutes that his talent would soon be widely known. We were all impressed with his piano performance skills. It was clear he was destined for more. And that certainly came to pass. Our paths separated, but I recall clearly one day hearing a very familiar arpeggio run on the radio and thinking, that sounds like Michael. And sure enough, when I checked, I found it was. With over a dozen CDs of his own original compositions, he is very well known in the acoustic music genre. And yes, the background music that is playing during this interview is his. Enjoy more of it as you listen to this interview with my friend, Michael Gettle. I'm really pleased to welcome Michael Gettle to Titans of Transition today. And you may have seen his music or listened to his music, I should say, on many different platforms, Spotify, you know, any any of the streaming platforms. He is pretty darn well known for his, I'll say, new age category pieces. And Michael has 12 different albums published, which he d- did a number of years ago and then pivoted, did some transitions into teaching. So anyway, with that little introduction, Michael, thank you so much for joining us on Titans of Transition. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's been on quite a while, Joe. It has been quite a while. And, and yeah. <laughs> that's a good segue because, you know, I was, again, I was just listen, listening to music on my Dish channel. And you came up a, a month or so ago, and I thought, wow, I really should reach out to Michael and see if he would be hmm. willing to come on as a guest. But Michael, you and I met years ago in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. We were at the same church at the time, and I play a little guitar, and I was on the worship team, and you sat in and helped lead worship on the piano. And I remember the rest of the worship team being floored. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna throw it on you, man by your just your natural talent and it was just amazing and you just sat in and just just played you know i didn't think you need any kind of rehearsal or anything but we got to know each other a little bit then and i think you know husband and wives we had a few you know kind of fellowship gatherings i think i remember one in your house in particular years ago as well but anyway glad to have you on and i think for those of you who are are Michael's fans, you're going to find this interesting to find out how he got into doing what he's doing today, but also how he started up in his musical career. So Michael, if you could, and I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you developed at early age your love for music and then take us into your recording and and some of those transitions and, and go from there. Well, music was always an enormous part of my childhood. I was a, a pretty good trumpet player at, at the time and, and learning to play piano. And I started both of those instruments at age eight, I believe. So the the funny part is my mom and dad, who are my biggest heroes, they, they basically spent the entire work week driving me up and down the mountain from Evergreen, Colorado to Denver for lessons on piano, on trumpet, orchestra rehearsals, jazz band rehearsals. So it was it was almost like an every night affair. And on top of that, my sister was a classical dancer at the Colorado Ballet. So she had to go down every uh, weeknight as well after school. And that was kind of our upbringing. My parents were so dedicated to helping me and my sister do what we had a passion for. So with that kind of support, one thing just led to another. And 
I was. So were your I never parents musical as well? Just curious. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> wow. But my dad, my dad really loves all kinds of music. But he he was a classical music admirer, and the biggest one of the biggest memories of my childhood is when he got a hi fi and a record player, and it was again, it was just nothing but classical music and driving me to to Denver, and it was just and, a and really And for those who aren't familiar movie. with that area, that's an interesting drive up I-70 to get to to and from Evergreen. And, you know, in Correct. the summer months, it's not too bad. There's a lot of traffic, but wow, it can be quite treacherous, actually. Oh my goodness, yes. Driving through snowstorms to get to Trumpet Lessons. There's this area, and, yeah, as I recall, you're getting closer to sometimes. Denver. Going down, you, you get to like where Red Rocks Amphitheater is, where there's a lot of concerts. And it can get kind of squirrely. Yes. It's one of those areas where there are truck escape lanes, <laughs> all kinds of things like that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it can be a little bit yeah. wild for sure. So... Very involved right. in music through Definitely. school. So how did you transition into becoming a recording artist? Interesting story, too. I started composing when I was in middle school. Middle school. And, of course, I wrote sappy lyrics and sappy songs and just completely off-the-page sappy stuff. But I kept writing and I kept writing. And then I ventured into more instrumental stuff. And so... I, I worked with my piano coach through high school, and she definitely knew that my interest in playing other people's pieces were waning, mm. and that what I really wanted to do was take a risk and uh, step out and do my own stuff. So by the time I, I graduated, and I had, of course, I went at the high school I was at, we went on double session. And so I actually went both sessions, so from like 7 o'clock to 5.30 just so I could get all the music courses I wanted. So by the time I was a senior, I was doing nothing but music all day, <laughs> which is just a brilliant life for a high school senior. It was just fabulous. So I made the decision that I obviously wanted to go into music and went to the university up in Seattle and basically was a trumpet and piano performance wow. major. And that, that university only lasted a year. There was just, it was a very, very small school. And so I, I came back and went to the University of Northern Colorado, which at the time, and I still believe it does, it has a massively a great reputation for jazz, composition, that kind yeah. of thing. And so before too long, I found myself changing my major to composition, and I had some of the greatest profs to help me. And, you know, writing flute sonatas and big uh, choral uh, pieces and all kinds of different stuff like that. But obviously, by the time you graduate from university, you need a job. <laughs> and there's not a whole lot that you can do with a, a double degree in music theory and composition. So out of just sheer uh, need, I fell into teaching at an independent school in Cherry Hills called Kent Denver School. And I didn't know how old a middle school seventh grader was. I didn't know the first thing about whatever I was doing there, but I just knew I had to do, I had to make this happen. And so the first, the first semester was pretty rocky in terms of, you know, getting my feet on the ground because I, I never aspired yeah, to be that's... a teacher. I always aspired to be a composer. So before too long, things really started to click. And I found much to my surprise, I absolutely love teaching. And I love the connection that I had with students. And so my, my time at Kent Denver was about eight years. And during that time, I was still pursuing, you know, recording here and there off to the side, trying to do little things. And before too long, my wife at the time and I, her family lived in Seattle. And so we would, we would go up virtually every summer for so many weeks. And, and I had a friend at the time who had a boat and we would always go up to the San Juan Islands, which is in between Canada and off the coast of Washington State, but in the Juan de Fuca Strait there, if you know any of that geography. And it's yeah. just absolutely stunning, stunning, stunning. And so bef before too long, I started, started writing piano pieces that were inspired by by that. And my friend had this idea, it's like, 
There are so many galleries and bookshops and things like that along this whole line and along the West Coast. I, I wonder if we should try shopping an idea. So I went into the studio and recorded about six rough tracks of piano. And, and we took it back up to the San Juans and we started asking people to listen to it. And we were saying, would you be interested in selling this kind of a product? And it was like, yes, 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 absolutely. So I went back and recorded a full album at the time. And it was, of course, cassette. <laughs> there, was, there, was no, <laughs> there was no, you know, CDs or anything at that point. But it just started to fly out of stores. And next thing we know, we got more of demand from, you know, national distributions and that kind of thing. And I, I went back and re-recorded the whole thing on CD. Michael, was, was this early on in the New Age? Kind of well, it, it was about 1986, I want to say. Okay. So the, the artists at the time were, well, there were two labels, Windham Hill and Narada. Yeah. And so I, I loved a lot of the Windham Hill artists. And it was, you know, it was just such gorgeous acoustic music. And the whole idea of New Age wasn't even attached to it. It was just new acoustic music. And uh, it just had an ambiance about it that was beautiful. And, and so I was very much inspired by a lot of those musicians. So back to San Juan Suite, once it was out on CD, it was just flying out of our garage. And so within a matter of about four years, we sold almost 500,000 copies out of a garage. Oh my gosh. And so was that sort of a, your own label? I mean, yeah, we uh, created a, a label called Sounding Records. And I obviously I wanted one CD wasn't going to do it for me because I had this, you know, this ambition, this passion to just keep writing. And so a second CD came out on that label. And then subsequently a third which was a lot more risky in terms of bringing in other musicians and that kind of thing and so it got to the point where i knew that if i didn't have any more additional help with say a bigger label that i didn't really know if this was going to work because it's even though you have that kind of success as an independent person, mm -hmm. I mean, if I did that now as an independent label, it would be like fabulous. But back then, back then, it, it in studio and it, it, just the logistics of pulling something like that off. It, oh, right. Yeah. And then and then on a national level, which is what was happening, these these distribution, yeah. independent distribution companies were wanting all this product and it was hard to keep up with that. So that was the time that three different labels approached me about signing with them. And one of them happened to be Narada. And it was so stressful because I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I wanted to do the right thing by my future, but I also had this loyalty to this partner. Mm. And, and so it was, a, it was a very difficult a decision to make, but ultimately I decided to sign with Narada, and and that's where the majority of my albums have been recorded. Was there just a question? I mean, it was a difficult decision, but was there some kind of a moment where things became clear to you? Yes, it was very interesting because what I what I neglected to say is once Kent Denver lasted for eight years, so this was still kind of happening while I was at Kent Denver, but I also knew that Seattle was the place. I really needed to be if I was going to make any kind of bigger inroads because that's where San Juan Suite was so immensely popular and all kinds of things. The West Coast was far more open to that kind of music at the time. And so as fate would have it, a teacher from a very well-renowned school at, in Seattle was visiting Kent Denver and was so interested in what I was doing with my kids that he asked me to come there and teach. And the funny part about it was I, I just wasn't sure about it, but then I don't, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this, Joe, but sometimes you get in, uh, you find yourself in this current and you can't, you can't really get out of that yeah. current because it's like, it's taking you somewhere and in your intuition says, I need to, I need to go with this current. And so I took the huge risk of uh, resigning from Kent Denver and moving, going to this, this other school in Seattle. 
uplifting my kids and and everything and saying goodbye to my parents and and that was that was a huge piece of this too so you felt like this was um, the current being the pull to seattle am i reading that right the pull to seattle and then realizing that there was an that chapter of my life in denver yeah. was over and and so i knew i could have stayed at that school for years and years and years and years but i i could not not accept the the need to really take that you know, risk and it's interesting because I've, I've heard similar stories with other guests and it seems like things reach a tipping point. So if you think about the current, absolutely do. I'll use that, that kind of word picture. The current was there, you were getting pulled, but all of a sudden the current became very strong to the point where it could not be ignored anymore. Absolutely. And it was, it was so, it was so much as if this was all designed yeah. that it was hard to, to not accept that. So um, going back to when the moment hit where it became clear you were asking about when I decided, I happened to actually be in the Southwest backpacking with students, which is something I did every, virtually every year. So I, I know the Four Corners and the Southwest pretty well as a, as a hiker and a backpacker. And this was the spring that these labels were asking me to, to sign. And uh, the pressure was immense because they weren't going to, neither, none of them wanted to take no for an mm. answer. And they were upping the ante and doing all these things. And I, I, I had done my homework and I knew how dog eat dog labels could be. And I knew that if I didn't get it right, I probably wouldn't have a second chance at that. So they, I kept getting harassed on the phone and by fax and all of this stuff. And I finally, I told the lawyer at Narada, I said, don't call me anymore. I'm going to the Southwest. I don't want to hear from you. I'm, I'm just out of the picture. So I'll get back to you when I feel like it. And so I let it simmer and I just, I traveled and I listened to music and I watched sunsets and I, I bonded with kids and I was able to finally make a clear headed decision that said, okay, I'll take this risk. But there was one thing that I really wanted to see happen. So I called this lawyer and I said, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. If you can fax me the contract tomorrow at this national park, then we'll probably, I'll probably <laughs> sign it. And sure enough, when we drove up to Zion national park, the, the park ranger was like, are you Michael Gettle? And I said, yes, he goes, handed me a stack of paper. <laughs> And, and, and so from there, it's just kind of the story that unfolded wow. after that. You know, I was in the studio literally six weeks later making my first record for them. That was the key. No, 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 no. Excuse me. Places and time. But why I let the album The Key slip right then was that was a record that was about four albums in. And it's probably one of my most favorite records because it really, when you're talking about transitions, it really is about an archetypal journey that people go through when they make transitions. And it's it just kind of opens with um, a tune called Waiting, and then it goes on to the turning of a key, and it goes through all these different emotional uh, journeys. And the, the last song on the album is called Through the Doorway. And the the little quote that I wrote for that, which I think is really appropriate for, for this segment, is some of our greatest satisfactions lie not in counting the number of doors we walk through, but in understanding how to handle the wow. keys. And for me, the key is a metaphor for process. And I believe that transitions, transition and process to me are one and the same. Because if you're transitioning from one period of your life to another, or from one job to another, from one relationship to another, whatever, if you're, if you're recovering from some kind of enormous crisis in your life, it's a transition. It doesn't just change the minute you want it to. Feelings don't go away immediately, but the word resilience also comes to mind too, is that uh, one of the things as a teacher I've, I've really been on a soapbox about was how to teach kids about resilience and just their social emotional well-being. And any, any adult who's resilient can probably navigate those transitions in their lives better than an adult that maybe doesn't have Absolutely. that kind of you know, yeah, learned ability to do I love that you brought out the whole idea of process because people kind of have an expectation that you know these transitions 
even come even coming to an awareness that something needs to happen can take years and decades sometimes and absolutely and even even saying yes. okay i definitely want to go in that direction you can be years in that process uh, of just making a shift right. because life is inherently messy and there there's a lot to it so absolutely. it's perfect to bring out this concept of resilience right there because you have to prevail through that process even when you have clarity well and uh, let's face it if if we're all wanting to be a better version of ourselves tomorrow <laughs> there you have to have some kind of ability to be resilient because the person you like today may still be the yeah. person you don't like tomorrow whatever it is but the more you try the more you stay focused on whatever that prize is whatever whatever your goals are you're gonna now so you were to school through. in seattle and now you're you're also Correct. i think you, you you pulled back and retired we'll talk about that in a minute but and you're t I just want to kind of oh yeah <laughs> put a little context around those statements. You're currently also teaching again. And where are you exactly in Colorado? Again, let's let people know. Well, I uh, my wife and I uh, live in a little tiny rural town called San Luis, Colorado, which is cradled at the base of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. It's you might say it's a, a foothill community because the mountains are right there. We're talking 14ers, but it's also uh, located in the San Luis Valley, which is the largest Alpine Valley in the world. And a lot of people, even <laughs> in Colorado, didn't even know that. But yeah, but we're home to one of the, one of the most amazing national parks, the Great Sand Dunes. And there's just the, the landscapes and the light yeah. is not to be believed. So it's it's about 16 miles from the New Mexico border okay. right. in the summer. All right, so Valley. let's let's pivot back now. So you started as you were teaching, you were composing, you were producing your own music. You moved up to Seattle. When you moved to Seattle, how many albums in were you? Had you already made the label shift at that point? I was I was up that had been 11 albums. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And so again, when when I, I spoke about my transition to go to a major label, the transition from Seattle to San Luis was really one of the riskiest, hardest transitions I've ever had to make. And it really, honestly, it really happened out of adversity because I had been at the school for 28 years, which is a long time. I I really have a value system that really puts an emphasis on loyalty, respect, kindness, community. And little by little with, with a leadership change at, at the school, that became not nearly as uh, clear to me as it once So the did. cultural shift that happened. There was a big cultural yeah. shift, not so much to the teaching approach, but to the faculty yeah. itself. And to put it bluntly, teachers who had a lot of tenure there were expendable because they were making way more than a, a new teacher could. And there was no sense of honoring that kind of service to a community for, for that long. So um, about 27 years in, I found myself opening a contract that was 33% less than I had expected. No one told me, no one said a yeah. word. It was just, here it is. And I was furious. I was heartbroken. I went to the head of school and I said, you know, can you explain this? And he had, you know, he passed the buck to someone else and whatnot. And he basically said, take it or leave it. Yeah. So, and that was his, it's approach. interesting. I mean, I think you sort of touched on this a little bit about being persevering. And after that many years, and lots of times we assume we made the choice. We're in the right spot. There's no need to transition. Everything's great. Right. But our environment is, is not static <laughs> over that kind of period exactly. of time. So you're just highlighting the fact that, yes, you did make the right choice and was right for a period of time with a certain Absolutely. mix of culture and other attributes that made it the right fit for right. you. But then it changed. Right. So it's no longer the right fit yes. for you. Well, and, you know, in hindsight, it was clearly the transition I needed. 
I mean, it, I so needed that transition. And I didn't realize it at the time. I mean, I was horrified just because here I was established at a at a job. I was doing two different careers at the same time, recording and teaching. I had three children to, to take care of, all of this stuff. And I just yeah. thought, I can't, this isn't going to work. So I, I knew that something had to change. But at the time, I didn't know what that was going to be. So I decided to hold steady. <laughs> and I tried my best to be resilient. And I told myself that I'm going to, I'm going to, when that tr transition happens, it's going to be on my terms. And I'm going to be the one to decide what that is. So I stayed an additional year teaching part time. And that's again when I mentioned earlier on the current. There's this current, and it really, it really started by my wife, who we had we had visited this part of Colorado once before, just because my parents still live in Colorado, and we were down on a road trip, and she had actually acquired some property in the area, and sight unseen, and so we drove out to see it, and we thought. What a quaint little place. This is this is just really, really lovely. And in the meantime, that final year, I was just miserable. I was miserable. I felt lost. I just knew that this wasn't working for me. My my kids had basically grown up and left. I was sitting in a house that was again needed a new owner, really, because somebody else needed to start their own chapter there. But I just didn't know how to how to make it happen. And so she's just shopping around. She loves real estate and she's just shopping around. And she said, oh, Michael, you ought to see this house. And it's right in San Luis. And she showed it to me and I said, we're going to buy that house. And it was that simple. And obviously one thing led to another because there was another buyer and that fell through mysteriously. And so basically in the course of from May to June, we sold a home in Seattle and relocated from a city that's liberal, that's very, very high energy, that's has a huge, huge, you know, amount of cost of living associated with it to a place that is peaceful, tranquil, no stoplights, any, any no different traffic than... jams, <laughs> elk and fox. Oh, well, and there was an element of culture shock to it initially, but the funny part, uh, Joe, is that I thought we were coming to a home that I, you know, we both fell in love with, and it ended up being so much more than that. We are so tight with our community. We've started a nonprofit called San Luis Music, which we hope to to see grow over the years to be able to give kids lessons more, you know, that can't afford them, or offer band camps in the summer, that kind of stuff. And so between between those efforts and people realizing that we were outsiders, but we were definitely willing to to do the work. I mm -hmm. taught at the school for two years. My wife is currently teaching in my old position. And it, the, the biggest surprise of all wasn't the landscape. It wasn't the house. Community. It was yeah. the people we met awesome. and have basically fallen in love with. The big value of mine. But so. another sense of a current pulling you Yep. And reaching a point. I mean, the, uh, the, the transition you went through in Seattle is what I, I term the transition that was thrust upon you. Absolutely. And Very. The adversity was immense. I've had several of those. those and what, like you're absolutely right. When you're in the middle of it, it couldn't feel like there is any other possible outcome that would be good. But then, as you said, you're blessed by being in this beautiful community and inspirational vistas right. out your window and oh i know so it's many the sun, things the sunset if you can't write music here you can't write music <laughs> anywhere you know it's just it's just too beautiful for words but i it's it's funny when when we talked a couple of weeks ago and reconnected i i stumbled upon a a little quote that i think was really really perfect for this this conversation and it's some somewhat kind of dovetails into my quote from the album the key but i just think this is so interesting it says when a door closes knock on it a few times but if it still doesn't open let it stay closed in career in love and life when you see the period at the end of a sentence 
don't try and turn it into a comma. Know when something is over and move on. That's and profound. if that doesn't if that doesn't talk about transition, oh yeah, I don't know. But that's exactly where I was in, in Seattle. I I could have when I when I was demoted essentially for money, I could have said, okay, I I don't have any way out of this, and that's the way it is. And I could have put a comma when he said, that's it. Period. That's what you're gonna get. But to have the fortitude and the self worth. To be able to say, I'm putting a period right here, yeah. and I'm moving on, yeah. and that takes courage, and everybody, every human being faces it. Yeah, yeah, but so. that's a that's a that's a real gem that quote, you know, because I think that so often in life we feel like we're we're pushing a rope, and you you know it's the door. But we have in, in mind something we think is the right thing, but it's just incredible. It's not going anywhere. Right. And you need to listen to these. <laughs> these it's signals. like a ham. It's like a hamster wheel. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's funny, so. you know, I do a look, I do some coaching and, and people I, I coach sometimes they have reached the conclusion that they're 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 in a certain career. And that's what they need to do. And that's what they're most gifted for. But often they may be skilled, they may be doing well, but maybe that's just not the best for them. <laughs> and right. so I think that it's it's kind of like the current kind of in another way, maybe a little bit on the opposite side, where there's this friction that they're in the middle of. So it's like mm -hmm. you're swimming upstream against the current. Yes. You know, and we well, are trying to hang I on to that... something that's not really the best situation for them. And I call that being stuck. Stuck. The hamster wheel. Of, and yeah. 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 Yep. And, you know, I know so many people really feel that right now in all kinds of ways, whether it's due to the events of, you know, yeah. the last <laughs> the 15 months or, or any kind of thing. But I do know, and it's, I think it was really evident to me by just being in Seattle and the high cost of living that is there and realizing if you've got a job even if you hate it and you're able to subs you know subsist on it and do whatever you need to do to to pay the mortgage and all of that it does feel like if you're miserable you're stuck and you that's when you you really have to go outside the box think outside the box and see if maybe it's not time for that transition to start yeah i think we we seek comfort and security Right. So sometimes we can be stuck in a situation that's paying the bills. It's it seems like the right thing from external sources and voices for us. And yeah. and we can't see ourselves outside of it. I mean, it's not even a paradigm we can consider until the current becomes too strong, either from an internal pull or from an external push. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. It has to reach that tipping point often because we just don't have awareness when you're on this on that wheel, you know, you get up every morning, you go through the routine, you get up every morning, you go through the routine. It's hard to, to have the perspective, I think. Yeah. And I, and I think fear is a huge motivating factor for people to be stuck. Oh yeah. And I knew that, I mean, going back to opening the contract, I was mortified about how I was going to make all this sustain this way of life that I had. And then there was even more fear about making this decision of having enough clarity to say the period stays, I'm, you know, I'm closing the door. So you really have to, you really have to find somewhere deep inside you, the courage and the bravery to, to start a transition and to make it happen. And you have to trust in that resilience you have to see it through to the end. So I want to talk a little bit now about kind of what you see coming forward or going forward to because i think the last time we talked you were considering on getting back into recording again is that right yeah it's been a bit of a hiatus just because of the teaching and my goodness the recording industry has changed oh, dramatically as as everybody knows and you know you can 
you can stream music like you were mentioning at the beginning. <laughs> Look at us right Pandora, now. Pandora, Spotify, uh, YouTube, all of it. And you don't, I, I guess you pay for some of those services, but as an artist, you know, I get pennies on a, a download yeah. at this point. And, you know, that can, that really is a struggle for a genre that has fallen out of favor in a sense. It There's still a, a niche for acoustic music, but the whole idea of, new age has kind of taken on this this different mystical kind of a thing and it did pretty much in the in the late Mm -hmm. 90s i guess or mid 90s and i've never seen myself as a new age artist i've seen myself as an acoustic uh, landscape yeah i didn't mean to put some negative connotation oh no 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 (laughs) oh absolutely but i i've always i've always seen it as somewhat of a negative connotation and that unfortunately that's the category i've always been put in whether it was like uh, Grammy nominations or anything, I mean, it's always new age mm-hmm. category, right? So, but the the thought here is that there's there's so much beauty that you can write about, and at this point in my recording career, it's really not about selling those five hundred thousand records. It's about it's about the experience of going in and doing it it's again to create. and and being really it's happy with the result. Yeah. You're at a different stage. You don't. You're not. You don't need to prove anything at this point. <laughs> well, and and you, you're right about that because there's something really liberating about just being, about not feeling like you have to prove anything to anyone, that you're you're perfectly content with the contributions you've made. That doesn't mean right. you're going to do nothing with your with your retirement or anything along that line. But there's a real liberation and freedom in in just being in a in a space where. You've gone through the transitions, and you've you've had that big adventure, maybe as a as an older individual, and and you landed on the right side of it, and and it's yeah. it's okay to coast. And there's at that point for the a interesting bit. <laughs> thing too is there's other formats and other things that could be done that might dovetail and put your teaching together with, you know, your 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 actual creative output. And your composition and your performance. There's lots of different things that people do that sort of meld those things together that you would have a hundred percent control Absolutely. over for one thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Well that's the that's one of the purposes for Song Luis Music, the nonprofit. It's it's kind of a big umbrella where my my wife Elizabeth Nakarado, that's her recording name. She just recorded an album a year and a half ago, finished it up and it got released through Song Luis Music. So she's definitely a mover and a shaker and <laughs> I gotta catch up with it. <laughs> so it's it's my that's an turn to record, album. I think. Yeah. Well, it's it's fabulous. It's it's called Souvenir d'Italia, and it's it's got oh, nice. mandolin and accordion and violin, and it's it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful journey through uh, Florence. Let's take so. a couple minutes and just sort of summarize some of the lessons you've learned. I, I and I'm just going to ask you to sort of pull them out if you would through these transition exper- experiences. It, it might be a little repetitious, but just. See what you can do to pull them together for people to be listening and might be going through a transition or struggling or maybe you're on that hamster wheel. Well, I there's just so many buzzwords that come come into my mind and and the one is uh, I think adversity and that I a lot of transition is born out of adversity and if you're going through adversity you have to you have to really be introspective and you have to think about what's in my control what's completely out of my control and if I did these steps and actually begin a transition you're you're actually taking control back you're giving yourself the power you need to be able to move ahead resilience is the other key buzzword i would say it doesn't happen overnight it's not easy to do no one likes uncertainty we we're all kind of security minded as human beings i think we want comfort we want all of the things that make us feel okay and safe and sadly so many people in the world don't have that luxury we are so fortunate to to really have that, I think, at least most of us. And just trusting your intuition about the current. And if, like you mentioned before, if you're going, going, going against a current, that should be a huge signal to you 
that this isn't the river you want to be in. You know, you need to find the stream next door or whatever because that current's going to pull you down eventually. So ride, you know, to use a analogy of whitewater rafting, you have to, you know, you have to know where the whitewater is and you have to ride it well so you don't tip your boat those are big. Yeah, but and plus I guess those are those the big uh, takeaways. Two quotes that you brought I out. Say. I think they're they were powerful and support those takeaways as well. So part of what I'll do is in the show notes on YouTube and also elsewhere I will include any references you provide me. <laughs> for, for but it's been great. I'd like to take a couple oh, minutes sure, now absolutely. Michael and just ask people where to find you. Just this is your opportunity to say if you want to find my music <laughs> or if you want to find my nonprofit, go ahead and just right. call those things out. And I'll also, folks, provide any links that Michael has available in the show notes and in the end card on the video as well. Right. Well, I guess, obviously, you can you can stream my music on all of the major platforms if you're interested in checking stuff out. Acoustically, I would say San Juan Suite 2 is a beautiful record because it it's probably the only album in existence that is only acoustic piano and fretless bass. And it's it's quite lovely and it's very very serene. The key, as I mentioned, is is one that is really close to my heart for the obvious reasons I talked about the archetypal journey and and just the transitions and walking through those doors of your life. It's it's a special record to me. And then finally, I would just suggest there's another album called The Journey North, which kind of celebrates my Scottish roots and um, super fun, very uplifting, a happy-go-lucky kind of a record with. All of the instruments you would expect from a Celtic kind of infused new age artist. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I would say that if you want to get in touch with us, we do have a, a website called sanluismusic.org. And, you know, if anybody feels all that compelled and they want to send me a private message, I'm, I'm, I have a Facebook page called uh, San Luis Music as well as my own. And you could just do that as well. I'd be open to connecting. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And Michael, thank you so much for being on Titans of Transition. Absolutely. It was yeah. a pleasure. Great to talk to you. I'm, great. I'm glad we were yeah, able to absolutely. reconnect. Hey, thanks for joining me today on Titans of Transition. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please check the show notes for additional information. Also, please like and subscribe to this channel.